Good morning and welcome to the online gathering of the Town Church. My name is Nate Downey and I'm a pastor at the Town Church. I'm really glad to be gathering together with you online today. Uh, I want to encourage you that if you haven't yet to sign up for our email newsletter that we send out usually weekly. <laughs> uh, and that's the best way to keep up to date with what we're doing as a church, uh, any plans that we have as we make them for uh, for what it will look like for us to begin to gather together again once uh, we're able to do that. So uh, go ahead and go to our website, thetownchurch.com, and you'll find information there on how to sign up for our newsletter and other resources that we have there. Uh, let's, let's begin for today. Uh, near the end of his book, Never Let Me Go, which I'm reading for the third time this week, uh, author Kazuo Ishiguro, he describes a dilemma that two of the main characters, Kathy and Tommy, have found themselves in. And I won't ruin the story because I, I think it's worth reading if you get the chance, but basically uh, they are in a, a pretty hopeless situation and, and they have one last thing that they can try. It's, it's a last ditch effort. And, and so they earnestly make an appeal to the authorities who they hope can turn their situation around. But it turns out that the solution they were looking for, it ends up being based on a rumor, a, a story. And as, as gently as they are told that there's, there's really no hope for them, it's, it's just it's still a crushing blow and, and they drive off and it's dark and it's raining. And at one point, Tommy uh, stops the car and he, he gets out and he goes down a hill into a valley, into the depths and looks at the sky and just yells. He's not yelling any words. It's just a scream of hopeless despair. And, and in the world of, of the book, at least as far as I could tell, there's no, there's no God to hear that cry. There's, there's no one to hear the desperation, no hope for the hopeless, no rescuer to come and save. The prayers in the Psalms in the Old Testament of the Bible are often the same, same way. They're, they're often the cries of desperate people who have run out of options. And sometimes it's because they dug a hole for themselves. Sometimes it's because they're the victims of injustice that's been committed against them. And sometimes we don't know why. They're, they're in a tough spot and they cry out. They're in a valley. They're in, in the rain with nothing left to do but scream into the darkness. But unlike Tommy, the writers of the Psalms know that there is a God who hears. There is a God who acts, a God who rescues, a God who saves. And the Psalms tell us over and over again that no matter how deep a hole we find ourselves in, we are never without hope of rescue. We are never alone. Now today, we will be looking at Psalm 34, where David expresses his gratitude and his trust in God. And this isn't a theoretical kind of trust. It is a trust that is rooted in a specific story from David's life. David's the author of this psalm. So let's read the text and we will get into Psalm 34. So grab your Bible and go to Psalm 34 which begins, of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, so that he drove him out, and he went away. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. This is God's word, and we say together, thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful today to be gathered together. In spite of our separation, you have brought us together in the unity of Jesus Christ, and we rejoice in that today. And I pray that, that you would draw us into worship and admiration and awe of you, and that we would have a clear sense of your nearness with us as we, as we wrestle through this difficult time, that we would know that you are near to those who are brokenhearted. And, and we count ourselves in that category today, uh, to be separated from one another and to be going through many of the things that we are going through. Help us to believe your promise from your word today. Open our hearts to believe. We ask it in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. If you've ever been with the town church at the beginning of our gathering, and that means you'd have to be on time, uh, which is a struggle for us sometimes, <laughs> you, you know that we begin by giving an invitation. And, and that invitation, it's a way that we remember the invitation that we have all received in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. It's, this invitation is to say, as a gathered church, we acknowledge and we recognize our own brokenness. And so now join together with us as we are being remade in Jesus. David begins Psalm 34 by offering an invitation as well. And, and these first three verses are a call to worship God. And, and, and David urges anyone who would hear or read this Psalm to know that he exists to worship God at all times. He wants his mouth to be a continuous stream of praise to God. He wants his soul, uh, who he is, to be brimming over with glad boasting in the goodness of God. It's, it's like he's saying, let me tell you about what I have seen, what I have experienced, what I delight in. And, and you could think about your own life. This is what we do with sports or, or art or hobbies or relationships, right? We, we boast in them. We talk about them and, and how much we enjoy them. But, but we need to recognize that, that Psalm 34, it's not, just, it's not just a song, an expression of people who are happy and feeling all pumped up. For God, when, when David says in verse 2, let the humble hear and be glad, that, what that literally means is, is that, that all who are discouraged and, and lowly and brought low hear what I'm going to say and rejoice. And so really this is a psalm for helpless people, for hopeless people who need support and need encouragement. And then David opens his arms wide and he says, Join me. Worship with me. Let's sing together. Now, what has got David so worked up? We find the answer to that in the title of this psalm, in Psalm 34. Now, you'll notice in your Bibles that there's a long title before, before verse 1 begins. And I didn't know this until I began studying the psalms and preaching through them 
that that these titles they weren't put in later uh, like the chapters and the verse divisions that were added many hundreds of years later when when a psalm begins with something like of david in, in like in psalm 35 or in psalms 121 and 131 that we've looked at they they begin by saying a song of ascents these are titles given by the Hebrew editors who originally collected and organized the Psalms. And most titles, uh, they merely give the name of the author or some ancient musical instruction. Many times we don't even know what those musical instructions mean. But the title of Psalm 34, it gives us a much clearer picture of what led to this particular prayer from David's life. We get to hear the story when when it says of this psalm is of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that Abimelech drove him out and David went away. And this is a clear reference to an event that we find recorded in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 21. And in this passage, David is on the run from King Saul. And Saul knows that David has been anointed as the future king of Israel, and so Saul wants him dead. And things have gotten so bad for David that he heads into the country of the Philistines, the land of the enemies of Israel. And specifically, he goes to the region of Gath, hometown of a certain giant named Goliath, which David has some history with, right? So David's hope is that when he gets there, he can sort of say, well, you know, Saul, he's your enemy, and Saul wants to kill me, so we're sort of together. Let's be friends. <laughs> but these these Philistines, they have a long memory, and they say, isn't this the same dude who, who killed our boy Goliath? Like, come on. And it's really not looking good for David. In 1 Samuel 21, it says in verse 12, and David took these words to heart, and he was much afraid of Achish, the, the king of Gath. Uh, the, the title of Psalm 34 uh, refers to Abimelech, and, and that's probably a title like Pharaoh. Uh, in, uh, so this continues in, in 1 Samuel 21, verse 13. So David changed his behavior before them, and he pretended to be insane in their hands, and he made marks on the doors of the gate, and he let spittle run down on his beard. Then King Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see, the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Psalm 34 is, is a song, a prayer, that was birthed out of this incredible experience that David had, that in trying to escape danger, he actually finds himself in a worse place. Now, I think we need to notice something about what David does here. Uh, in, in trying to imagine myself in this same situation as David, I, I feel like I would be pretty proud of myself for coming up with the... Uh, the whole I'll pretend I'm a crazy person idea. Uh, I think it's the kind of story that, you know, I would love to tell at a party, especially because it has the perfect payoff. They totally bought it. They think he's actually crazy. But that's not what David does. He doesn't boast in himself or in his quick thinking. Instead, he turns it into an opportunity to remember that when we are at our lowest, when we have run out of options, when we have nowhere else to turn, that someone is listening to the cry of desperation that rises from fearful hearts. David was afraid, and God rescues him. This next section of Psalm 34 tells the experience of how God rescued David. And, and so... This is worship that is grounded and rooted in a very real sense of danger and rescue. When David came to the end of himself, he recognizes that it was God who heard him and it was God who saved him. He says in verse 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. 
Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This literally means faces that are beaming with joy because they will never ultimately lose hope. Verse 6, David says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. David was really at the lowest part of his life when he barely escaped from Gath. He is alone. He has no food. He's lost his wife. He's lost his best friend. And he's a fugitive from his former mentor. If you ever feel like you can't sing, you can't pray, you can't read your Bible because things in your life just aren't going well, I want you to remember this psalm. Because this psalm gives a voice to people who don't know what else to say and aren't sure if anyone is even listening. Do you ever feel like that? Because I know that I do feel that way sometimes. Now, we don't know exactly when David wrote Psalm 34, but I think it's important for us to remember that David didn't go from being alone and pretending uh, that he was insane straight to being the anointed king living in the palace and experiencing victory and peace. He was delivered from death in this moment, but he's still in a tough spot. There's still a long road, many years of difficulty in front of him. And I love this. I think, I think that, that this shows us that we can, we can sing, we can pray, we can worship God by degrees. We can pray for the moment that we are in and then pray for the next moment we find ourselves in. I think I'm often discouraged from prayer and worship of God because I don't get immediate resolution of the whole issue or the whole situation right away. I think this is why it's been difficult for me, maybe for some of you, to pray during this time of pandemic because it feels like it's going to be such a long, drawn-out process with solutions that... that feel like they're out of our reach, out of our control. But David is showing us, here's how you can pray in a moment-by-moment kind of way. We will still have trouble. We will still have difficulty and fear and opposition. But we will ultimately be delivered from all of them. And we can pray with that confidence and hope, drawing near to God moment by moment, day by day. Now we've heard David's invitation. We have heard his story. We've we've seen his experience. Now we can receive David's instruction. Knowing, Knowing that God hears us and meets us in our lowest moments, David He's he's taken on the voice of a teacher and instructing us. He says in verse 11, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And in verse 8, he encourages us not just to enjoy the goodness of the life that God provides for us, but to enjoy the goodness of God himself, to enjoy and to recognize the beauty and the satisfaction that God is in himself. Verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. James Boyce, uh, talking about this passage, he says that this verse encourages us to try God out, almost physically, just as we would with some great treat or delicacy. Although God is more than this image suggests, he is certainly not less. King David wants us to act on what we know of God and his goodness, for only then will we actually experience for ourselves how good God truly is. Uh, When it comes to cooking, I am not a a good cook uh, myself, but but I do have, I can think of so many moments and I savor them when, when Dallas or somebody else who's actually good at cooking uh, and they say, here, 
try this and they give you a taste of what is to come and 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 you just can't wait for the full meal and david's telling us i've experienced the goodness and the faithfulness of god now you try try this test this out david continues his instruction by showing us that god is good and god does good he provides himself and he provides for all of our needs look at verses 9 and 10 fear the lord you his saints for those who fear him have no lack the young lions self-sufficient and strong they suffer and want they suffer want and hunger but those who seek the lord lack no good thing david picks up his instruction again in verses 12 through 16 and, and david use he's using these words to encourage and instruct the people of god here's what a life lived in the fear of god looks like especially through hardship in the new testament in the book of first peter the apostle peter he quotes this passage psalm 34 numerous times uh, but but he uh, in in chapter 3 he quotes this passage to describe here's what life looks like for people who are following Jesus in difficult times. Verse 12, what person is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? That's all of us, right? Here's the instruction. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Now, both David and Peter are teaching us that the goodness of God experienced through his grace and his mercy toward us, they should lead to a life of joyful, glad obedience. The, the temptation for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the book of Genesis, their temptation was to believe the lie that God was not good, that he was, that he was withholding something from us. And when they believed that lie, they disobeyed God. And, and that same lie, it's at the root of all sin, all the sins that we commit. But, but God does not reject us as we deserve. He he comes after us. He graciously pursues us. He makes a way for us to return to him, to once again believe in and experience his goodness through Jesus. And as we do this, our lives begin to look more and more like what these verses are talking about. Lives of obedience, lives of, uh, of life-giving speech, of turning away from evil, pursuing what is good, seeking peace and not letting it go. Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner, he says, the good that you enjoy goes hand in hand with the good that you do. It, it is an emphasis which answers the suspicion that was first aroused in Eden that outside the will of God rather than within it lies enrichment. What he's saying is that a life of true blessing and enjoyment is found within God's will. We've seen the invitation and the story and the experience and the, and the instruction of David, but, but this psalm really concludes with a promise. And, and I want to give this promise the weight and the authority of, of, by pointing out that, that this is God's promise to us just as it was God's promise to King David. And all of this psalm, just like all of the Bible, it's, it's ultimately more than the encouragement or the instruction of faithful people who followed God. We call the scriptures the word of God because it, they are inspired by God. And so Psalm 34, it's not merely the expression of faith and gratitude by a person, it's ultimately divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so that means that we can stake our lives and our hope on what it says because it's God's word. So hear the conclusion of Psalm 34 as God's promise 
to you. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their trouble. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the lives of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. The truth is that we all experience difficulty, no matter who we are, where we live, our family of origin, any factor you can think of. Because of the effect of sin and how far-reaching it is, we are all crushed in spirit and brokenhearted. Our afflictions are many. But the promise of God through Psalm 34 is that he hears our cries. He is near to us in our pain and that he, that he will rescue us. So when we are at our lowest, when we have run out of options, when there is nowhere else to turn, we are not alone. We are not forgotten. We have a God who hears us, a God who sees us, a God whose face is turned toward us. And, and this, this isn't just the promise of Psalm 34. It's the promise of all of Scripture, all of the Bible. Uh, James Boyce, again, he says, the ultimate fulfillment of these promises from Psalm 34 is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Deliverance here is good, but what is essential is deliverance from the eternal punishment due us for our sins. And for that deliverance, we must look to Jesus Christ. The first part of verse 22 says the Lord redeems his servants. How? By the death and resurrection of Jesus. The second half of verse 22 says, no one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Why not? Because Jesus has taken that condemnation in our place. Jesus was put to shame to deliver us for, from our sin. Jesus experienced the turning away of his Father's face so that we, you and I, could be reconciled to God. Jesus' body was broken and his blood was poured out so that we might be restored to God. Jesus tasted the bitter cup of God's wrath in our place so that we might taste and see that the Lord is good. I want to encourage you uh, to continue to trust in God's promises to you and, and that you would see your life uh, as a, as a declaration and a display of the good news of Jesus, and that your life, your, your whole life would be an invitation to other people to follow Jesus with you as you taste and see that he is good. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the invitation we've received today from, from you through your word. To, to taste and see that you are good, not just to know these things, but to experience them. And I pray for us as we are in the midst of a difficult time, a trial, that, that we would put our hope in you. That, that as, our, uh, as our spirits, our hearts are discouraged, and, and we are at low points, many of us, that, that we would look to you and we would we would never be hopeless, that we would always remember that your face is turned toward us, that we would continue looking to Jesus at all times and see, Jesus, what you have won for us, our place in your family through what you've done for us. We delight ourselves in you, Jesus. Help us to continue to find our joy in you and that we might share that joy with others who also are so desperate for hope in these times. We ask all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, Town Church, I love you and I miss you. I can't wait to be back together with you uh, in some way, in some form. And, and for the past several weeks, we've been doing a, kind of a 
Q&A, hangout, prayer time on Zoom. And I just want to let you know that we're not going to be doing that today. And we're not going to be doing that next week uh, because I'm going to be doing some things on those afternoons, on Sunday afternoons. So I just, just want to, we'll, we'll probably pick it back up again uh, when we come back to this in a couple weeks. Uh, but I just want to let you know we will not be doing those Zoom Q&As uh, this week, today, or next Sunday. So uh, I encourage you to reach out to our church family. You can email info at thetownchurch.com. Uh, there's other ways to contact us you can find on our website, thetownchurch.com. I love you all. I'm praying for you, and I miss you.